I'm going to mainly talk about what's happening in this country and how they're doing it. But I want to start by putting a couple of numbers in your head because we're all here ultimately not just to protect our democracy, but to protect our children. And, you know, there's a lot of partisanship and there's a lot of polarization in this country. But we all have to start recognizing the fact that there are no such thing as Republican children or Democratic children. And I don't tell anybody not to get vaccines. It's your personal choice. And we all have to make different calculations. And for some age groups and people who have certain comorbidities, it may make sense. Two numbers. They say that these vaccines, again and again, you'll hear it on CNN, that these vaccines are 95% effective. Here's what, they, and using one metric, which is a metric of relative risk, that's true, but using the metric that we all think that they're talking about, which is absolute risk, it is less than 1%. And that's not me that's saying it, it's the Lancet. In the July 1st issue, they looked at each vaccine, and what I mean by that is they calculated and in order to, to prevent one case of mild COVID, you have to inject 117 people with two Pfizer vaccines and about 87 people with the Moderna vaccine. So they all have different numbers. That's the true. So then you have to say, well, how many injuries am I going to have in order to prevent one death? And at that point, knowing what they know, what we know about the failures of the VAR system, nobody can answer the question about whether that vaccine is averting more injuries and deaths than it's causing. And there's plenty of evidence, as you guys know, that it is. And I'm glad to announce that England withdrew the mandate for children. And I hope... And the other, the other number, and I don't want to talk a lot about vaccines, I want to talk about Tony Fauci and how he got away with it. Um, but the other number that you should remember also from The Lancet is that for children between four years old and 16 years old, that the death rate from COVID is 1.6 per million. That means you got to give a million vaccines to prevent one and a half deaths. And uh, you know you're going to have a lot of mayhem if you do that. Oh, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. I'm going to talk about something that all of us have been bewildered about, which is how did it happen that the people in power were able to impose totalitarianism on America overnight? We, I grew up in a world where Republicans and Democrats agreed with many things. And they agreed with the idea that everybody had a right to speak. That the free flow of information is the oxygen, it's the, it's the nutrients for democracy. That if there's a policy that it has to prevail in the marketplace of ideas, that's how democracy functions, through open debate. We all agreed that the first step in every totalitarian regime is censorship. And that I might not agree with you, but I will die for your right to say yeah. what you want to say. <laughs> and I'm going to start also just mentioning something that we need to remember as Americans. There are many things that are worse than death. And that we need to love our freedom more than we fear disease. And, and that the founders of our country, the people that we all grow up heroizing and, and admiring, the people who fought in the American Revolution, who died in the American Revolution, they were dying to preserve a con to create a constitution that we could live by. And we need to be willing to die for that constitution too. 
And if we're going to honor what they did for us, if we're, you know, America is not just a landscape and a bunch of people who got together and whoever dies with the most stuff wins. That's not who we are. We're people who are bound together by principle and shared values. And those values are embodied in that document that people, our ancestors, died for. They passed without any regulatory authority the CARES Act and the PREP Act that said anybody, any multinational corporation who says that they are helping out with a pandemic, that's called a countermeasure, they are immune from liability, no matter how reckless they are, no matter how negligent their conduct, no matter how, the to how toxic the ingredients that they give to your children, you, no matter how grievous your injury, you cannot sue that company. They are immune. And we know what happens when you take away that incentive. They have no incentive to make those products safe. And so, and we can see what the outcome is for that. Now, I didn't mean to talk so much about that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to tell, talk to you a little bit about what Tony Fauci did and how this happened to our country. We are, let me go back a little. When I was 10 years old, my uncle was about to be sworn in as president. I went to the inauguration. On my birthday, which was January 17th of that year, Dwight Eisenhower gave the most, one of the most important speeches in American history. And the most important speech in his lifetime where he warned Americans that America would never be destroyed by a foreign enemy. What we would be, our values, our constitution, everything important about it, our country, everything enduring and admirable would be robbed from us by malefactors of great wealth, the military industrial complex. And at that time was growing out of control. My uncle spent the three years of his presidency fighting against that complex, fighting a war with his own military apparatus and particularly with the intelligence agencies. He fired Alan Dulles, he fired Bissell, he fired Cabell, and he died in that endeavor. He refused to put combat troops in Vietnam. He put 16,000 advisors. He wouldn't put the combat troops in or in Laos. And my father, six months after my uncle left, Vietnam was an American war. 500,000 Americans in it. 50,000 dead. My, uncle, my father ran for president in fighting that military industrial complex campaigning against the war. He was killed in that endeavor. And in 1988, it all ended. Walls came down, the Berlin Wall came down. We were told that we were going to get a peace dividend. The Cold War was over. We no longer had to build stealth bombers that cost $1 billion for one plane that can't even fly in a rain. We were going to be able to, be able to take that money and put it into our schools, our education, our roads, our police, our bridges. And we were supposed to finally make America a shining city on a hill. But what happened? The military industrial complex heard that. And they said, that money is coming out of our pocket. In 1993, we had the first attack on the World Trade Center. And all of that money that was headed to us, the brakes were put on it. And in 2001, the same thing happened. And we became a national security state. Uh, three weeks after 9-11, it was an anthrax attack. It turned out it had come from, they blamed it, blamed it on Saddam Hussein. We went to war with him because of that. It turned out that it came from one of three U.S. military labs. And the, the lab that it almost certainly came from was by a vaccine maker who is partners with Tony Fauci. It's called Emergent, one of the COVID vaccine makers. And, they, and the, the intelligence agencies, which were, how many of you have heard of Event 20? 201. Yeah. Event 201 is a simulation that they did 
right before COVID hit. Actually, it was in October, so it was already circulating. And it was a drill for how to handle pandemics. But it didn't do the things you would think they would do, like how do we fix the VAERS system to make sure that we get good data? How do we create isolation hospitals where older people who have COVID, we can send them there instead of sending them to nursing homes? How do we develop therapeutics like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, off-the-shelf therapeutics, and do it very quickly? How do we get doctors together and to talk about what's working? How do we tell people how to bolster their immune system? How do we stockpile vitamin D and get it to every black person in this country because they're all vitamin D deficient? How do we do these things? They didn't talk about any of that. What they talked about was how to turn America into a totalitarian state. How to impose censorship. And the story of these simulations is critically important because it was the way that they prepared. They didn't just have a few people involved. They had hundreds of thousands. Cops who were, these were all top secret. Police officers in every community in this country, healthcare workers, first responders, were all drilled in this. How to censor, how to silence, how to impose tracking and tracing, how to do control. So they all went through these drills again and again, and it was a way of drilling and practicing a coup d'etat against American democracy. And I'm going to tell you one other thing, and I got two minutes left. They, all of the all of the techniques they use, I've spent a lot of time studying the CIA because my family was in a 60-year fight with them, and I wrote a book about that battle called American Values. But I've read all of their manuals, and they have techniques for going into indigenous countries and causing chaos, shattering the society, destroying the economy, creating social distance between people so that there's no unit cohesion. And then when everybody is demoralized and destroyed, coming in with a centralized control and imposing, as they did with all of us, they locked down America in a hostage taking. And they impose something that is part of their technique, which is called Stockholm Syndrome, where the captive becomes grateful to their captor and identifies with them and understands, comes to this belief that the only way that they can save their lives is through absolute obsequious obedience to their captors. And all of these drills were intended to, to impose and to induce that condition in the entire public. And I'll tell you one other thing. The CIA, which I show in my book, the CIA did a series of mind control experiments back in the 60s and 70s called MK Ultra and Project Artichoke. And one of the famous experiments was called the Milgram experiment. And the Milgram experiment, and you guys look it up, Milgram experiment. What they did is they brought volunteers from every walk of life, college professors, construction workers, everybody. They put them in a room with a doctor in a lab coat, a figure of authority. And he would tell them, turn up the electricity and shock the person who's in the next room. That person was an actor. And he, they would turn it, tell him, turn it up, turn it up higher, turn it up higher. It went into the death zone. 67% of the people put it into the death zone, even though many of them weren't crying at the time. They were begging the doctor not to make them do it. And what they found was that using authority, particularly doctors in white lab coats, 67% of the public will violate their own conscience and do what they're told. It was with a Wuhan lab okay, in 2014. The reason that Tony Fauci was doing gain of function is because after the anthrax attack, billions of dollars started pouring into bioweapons research. And Tony Fauci needed to get his share. So he gets 
He gets $6.1 billion from us, the U.S. taxpayer. He gets $1.6 billion every year from the military, Lombarda and DARPA and the Pentagon. And that is for doing bioweapons research disguised as vaccine research, because they're the same thing. It's called dual use. In 2014, a bunch of his little creatures escaped. They didn't injure anybody, but there were real scares. And people found out about it. And 300 top scientists in this country wrote a letter to President Obama saying, you got to shut down Fauci. President Obama ordered Fauci to stop. Fauci stopped 21 of the experiments, but the worst ones by a psychopath called Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina. He kept going. Plus, he moved his money offshore out of the nosy oversight of the White House to the Wuhan lab. The Wuhan lab was built by a French company called BioMiro. That company, and this is something nobody knows, but it's in my book, and you guys are the only people who know it. <laughs> that company was built by BioMiro, and BioMiro contracted with the Chinese to install what they call a negative airflow system, which is a critical piece of infrastructure for a bio for lab. Because what if you don't want air going out of that lab, the air can only go in and nothing come out because those viruses are so tiny, you can't filter them. So they're going to get out if you have any air coming out. So this this infrastructure piece is very complex and very important. And BioMiro was contracted to put it in. But guess what? They never did. And the CEO of BioMiro was a French man called Stephen Boncel. Stephen Boncel today is the CEO of Moderna. which is the company that has made billions and billions. They now have a net worth of $60 billion because of that escape. And I wrote a letter to him and asked him about this sequence, and I never heard back from him.